you know, traditionally, it's really hard to get a good idea out of the heads of our executives if they're already fully planted, even if they make no sense. So for me, this this is usually a combination of can we get better tools that help us with the insights and gather the better data and the metrics? And then are we actually measuring the things that matter to the company so that there is credibility and impact? If we're measuring the right things, everybody wants to help and get on board. If we're just sending out data and random numbers and you know OKRs we didn't think much about, they don't move the business ahead and nobody cares. Delighted to be here today with Rich Miranov. Rich and I know each other from a long time ago um, when he was a product consultant um, for a company that I was working at. And, and Rich has been a product consultant for a, a long time. So he knows the game and is also often an interim product leader. So th- hello, Rich, and thank you so much for joining the video cast. Right. It's my pleasure, Rachel. Thanks for letting me join in. I'm very excited to talk to Rich today about the idea of being more data-driven and how product teams and product executives can ensure that their teams are being more data-driven or appropriately data-driven. So Rich, like, what have you seen are the biggest pain points that product teams experiment, um, experience when they're trying to get to insight? It, it's a tough one, and, and often it's a mix I see of both uh, data or tools issues, but also some executive cultural issues. Right. So in a company that's not used to being data-driven, they're probably uh, sales-driven or executive-driven, or I had a really good thought this morning in the shower before I commuted to the office you know, traditionally, it's really hard to get a good idea out of the heads of our executives if they're already fully planted, even if they make no sense, right? So so for me, this this is usually a combination of, can we get better tools that help us with the insights and gather the better data and the metrics? And then are we actually measuring the things that matter to the company so that there is credibility and impact? If we're measuring the right things, everybody wants to help and get on board. If we're just sending out data and random numbers and you know OKRs we didn't think much about, they don't move the business ahead and nobody cares. What is what have you seen when you're working with companies? Like what is the state of the state? Like, do companies have those metrics? Do they typically have good KPIs? Where 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 are companies with this today? Of course, they're all over the map. And and I have to admit to a little bit of selection bias here myself because companies that are doing a really good job on OKRs or metrics or product strategy are a little less likely to call me than the other ones. So uh, some bias here, but, but what I see is that almost everybody has figured out that OKR is three letters they want to talk about with their board, you know, and they probably have a copy of Christina Wodke's book on a shelf that hasn't been opened, right? Or they have um, Alex Osterwilder's um, canvas is handy, but it's the thinking that's important here, right? So uh, something I've seen probably a dozen times is a company that spent a whole year arguing about whether they should have OKRs in general, and then about 35 seconds deciding what they, those OKRs should be and picking entirely wrong ones, right? And so that's a really slow path to failure because what we didn't do was we didn't spend time thinking about what needs to be measured and how we're going to use it to drive the business and why anybody cares. Uh, OKRs in those cases just become some, the next top down, you know, command and control thing where people get given numbers to achieve, right? And it just never works, right? So, so for me, probably the number one challenge is, are we putting enough thinking and research and experiments into the metrics we choose, instead of just deciding that where you should have some metrics somewhere. Yeah, that's a great call out. You know, I'll say like I I joined Heat not that long ago, and we spent some time early on figuring out what do we think are our key our, our KPIs, right? And then we created OKRs. But I'll tell you, a lot of the OKRs the first quarter are okay, we're going to try to move this, we're we're both going to try to baseline this metric and move it by some amount, right? But that we're, we warned everyone that we were going to get it wrong. And and that's good. That's exactly right. Because the first, the first quarter or two of OKRs, we're learning how to use them. We're picking out the ones that matter. 
Uh, some things that we think are going to be easy to improve are not. Um, one other thing I, I see a lot is, um, well, maybe the worst thing is we decide our OKR is, is revenue, right? So our goal for the company is to put another $100 million on the top line. That's really, I guess, good for the sales team, but it's of no use in product strategy, right? We actually have to figure out what our strategy is, where we're going, current state, what's broken, right? What If we... You know, if we got our enterprise customers onboarded faster, which would be great, does that actually lead to more customers or happier customers or lower churn or something rather than just we move this metric and the business doesn't care, right? So, uh, you know, I think you're doing the right thing, which is you, you pick some metrics, you measure them or best you can, you see if you can move them ahead, but you shouldn't be embarrassed to make changes the first couple of quarters to something that makes more sense. What are some of the things that you've seen when um, companies don't have good metrics? You kind of alluded to some of that, like the top down thing, the teams don't understand how to react to them, but you know, do you have any good stories you could share? Oh yeah, sure. And, 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 and the useful thing here to remember is at least for the most part, folks do what we measure and what we reward them to do, not what we want them to do, right? Mm -hmm. So so a classic one I've run into a few times is where um, the company decides that we should get customers off the tech support helpline faster. And so what we do is we start to measure the average length of the support call and we reward the support team for shorter calls. Right now, unless we've done something else that actually solves the customer's problem faster, this is horrible. So maybe we should have gotten, you know, some better lookup system or some Q&A or chat bots or whatever, right? But if all we do is we tell the support team that they need to have shorter calls, what they do is exactly what we reward them. They start to hang up on customers without having solved their problem. And of course, then half of those folks are all, you know, unhappy and and, and walk away because we're terrible. And the other half call back to get more help. We haven't fixed anything, right? So uh, I, another one uh, that I love is on the sales side. So I'm a really big proponent that if you're in the software product business, as opposed to the software services business, you want to do every possible thing you can to reduce the service overhead of selling another customer, right? Easier onboarding, partners who do integration, all this stuff, right? Uh, So that we could sell 500 more customers next quarter and not be bottlenecked on the implementation or customer success side, right? Mm -hmm. But if we pay our sales teams the same rate of commission on specialty support services and custom development as we do on selling our package software, turns out that selling customized, whatever bespoke, we'll do whatever you want, craziness stuff that pulls our engineers in is easier. And so we're setting our salespeople up to sell just what we don't want them to sell. Whereas there's an easy fix for here, which is not an engineering fix. If we, for instance, reduce the commission rate on custom services from 100% to 20%, all the salespeople figure out that they should be selling the, the package product and the company's doing fine, right? Or maybe we should just be a professional services firm. So, so those are two places where we didn't think of the obvious implications. We didn't, we didn't play the next cards in the game of what happens when we, you know, we, we turn down all requests that come from all customers that pay us less than our top five customers well, okay, those, those demands didn't go away. What do we do with them, right? So, so, you know, thinking through the human behavior, thinking through the implications at a departmental level seems really important. So when you're thinking about either your key performance indicators or you're trying to set up your goals or your, a, your OKRs, um, do you have any guidance on how do you think about what is a good metric? what metrics you should have and, and how to, how to create a good metric. Sure. Um, by the way, um, Josh Seiden has a great book on this for anybody who hasn't read it. It's called outcomes versus output. And it's got some subtext in there anyway, but, but he's really smart about thinking through first, what's the customer behavior we're trying to change, 
Mm. right? What's the business outcome? What's the thing that has to be different before we get all in our tech and start, you know, re-architecting and putting machine learning in and figuring out how to Bitcoin or whatever craziness we're going to do, right? So for instance, if we're having a lot of churn, if we're in the SaaS enterprise business and we're having a lot of churn, before we decide that this is a problem, we probably want to figure out why we're having churn. Mm -hmm. So maybe we're signing up a lot of the wrong customers who don't really want our product because we're marketing and selling to the wrong people, right? Well, that suggests the thing we got to fix is on the marketing and sales side, right? Or maybe the onboarding workflow is really terrible and nobody can figure out how to give us their credit cards which case we've got a UX and engineering problem, right? Or maybe um, our systems are down all the time and people love them for the first six or eight weeks, but then they lose all their data and they're screaming at us on social media, right? In which case we have a DevOps and, you know, cloud ops kind of problem, right? So, so it's great to first identify what's not working. We have too much churn. But before we assign an OKR to reduce churn or increase, you know, dollar weighted renewals or something, it's really handy to figure out what's broken, right? Because the things we're going to do, we're going to come up with all kinds of things that are going to, we hope, reduce churn. But if we're missing the top two or three real root causes, then we're mostly wasting our time, right? So, so you know, we could we could take this in steps and say, okay, step one is clearly we have a churn issue. We have a renewal issue. All right. Hmm. Let's go talk to the last 45 customers or users who failed to renew and find out what happened. Right. Because I don't want to fix the wrong problem. Now, now, once we do that, and one of the questions, by the way, I always like to ask is how do those customers measure success? Right. So if, if I've got some new software for call centers, right? Then the measure of success may be shorter calls or faster closes or looking up the right answer or upselling or who knows what, right? And we're going to have trouble figuring out how to improve customer satisfaction and reduce churn if we don't know how our customers keep score because we may be fixing the problem from the wrong end, right? So customer interviews, discovery, and of course, we got to look at the data, Right. So in a churn situation, something I'd love to find, or in my case, I'd love to delegate somebody else to find, is are there some behavioral characteristics of our good customers, mm -hmm. right? That's different from the ones who are churning away, right? Maybe we did really good onboarding and we got them to run the first two reports and now they know what our software does. And those are the people who stay. So, so we better have a goal to get all of our new customers to run a couple of reports or see why our stuff is good, right? Or maybe, you know, the, the customers that stick with us are the ones who sign up a lot more users, right? Or who share a lot of internal documents if we've got some document management system or who, um, if they're on this, you know, some kind of sales tool, they're the sales reps who make more money and sell more stuff, right? So looking at the behavior, looking at the data, looking at the workflows, you know, whatever it is, can we figure out what good looks like? Because again, before we spend a million dollars training up and, and onboarding all of our new customers to see the best reports, be really handy to know if that actually matters. Right? Yeah. You know, along the lines of that um, behavioral data, um, same question kind of I asked before, like, what do you think the state of the state is in terms of, you know, customers you've worked with that have that information and customers you've worked with that just don't? Oh, I think we're early, we're in early days here. We're in early adopters that, you know, there are some companies out there that are methodical, that are thoughtful, that are aggressive, that have really good tools to track that are, they're watching the stuff like crazy. Right. I would give that 8%, I don't know, 11%, right? Someplace up at the top. So many more of them are, they're either gathering no data at all, they're gathering the wrong data, or, or maybe even worse, um, they're taking sales numbers at the product level to decide which products are succeeding. 
right? Well, a lot of people are buying product X and they're not buying product Y. Um, I'm not quite sure what to conclude about that, right? But, you know, when we tell product folks that their responsibility, their only responsibility is deliver revenue and not to think about why folks are succeeding, um, I think they're driving the wrong way on a one-way street, you know? So Rich, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge. Um, I know that you do lots of talks and you've written a lot on, on you know, these topics that we talked about as well as much more stuff. Where can people find out more? Well, I, I've cleverly managed to get my last name as my domain. Um, and it has, uh, at this point, 20 years of blog posts. I started blogging in 2001 because that's when blogs really arrived. And there's probably, I don't know, 80 or 100 recorded talks and whatever. So I just encourage folks to come to my site, take anything that's useful. It's all free. And, uh, and hopefully they'll find some insights, which, of course, I can't know until they tell me it was something new that they didn't know before. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again. Oh, my pleasure and, and uh, enjoyed it very much.